Okay, my friends, life just gets stranger and stranger and stranger. This morning I get up, I th I've been thinking about doing something on salt, because I really want to understand the origin of salt. Where did it come from? Why do we end up with these formations of salt like this? I know what that was before it turned to salt. But why did it turn to salt like that? So, and I, you know, what I do is I sort of go a little deep on these things, and I've searched everything I could find out about salt, but basically it's, it's, it's biology converted. This is pork ribs, this is a salt mine, pink salt mine. Now, and, and it has all the same minerals as it does in blood, in, in these pink salt mines and so forth, because there's different chemistry, see here, Himalayan salt, has these different potassium and calcium, magnesium, so forth. Um, Celtic salt has this, and you know, table salt has almost nothing of anything. So there's there's different varieties. Well, here you here you go, right here. This is probably the best thing. You know, Hawaiian green salt. Well, why is it green? Why is it green? These are transition metals. That's regular table salt. This is Peruvian pink, English gray. Why is it gray? Uh, that's regular sea salt, and then that washes out to be very white a lot of times. This is a Himalayan pink. Now, I want to show you something which is extremely cool. This is a Himalayan salt inhaler. You just take a couple of hits off of this thing, you know, a couple times a day, and clear your lungs right out. Absolutely fabulous. And I, what did I tell you about the, the salt mine survivors? <laughs> they were in World War II. They went into the salt mines to hide, and they came out healthier than when they went in because of the salts going into their lungs. We'll talk about the chemistry and so forth. But then you get the Danish smoke salt, Cypress Sea. What is this here? Indian black salt, Persian blue, Hawaiian red, Hawaiian black. And red and black, that's blood. These are, these are things... Hawaii is a different type of volcano than an explosive volcano, but it still is biological. I'm telling you, there is nothing that is not biological. And if you look at this right here, this is nothing more than layers of tissue. And guess what? This top layer up here will not accept the salt. You see it? It won't fuse with the salt, it looks like. Down here where you have the, the gooey, wet, fleshy stuff, this is a layer of keratinized skin basically down here it'll the the wet fleshy bloody stuff where it transfers metals and and um, all your nutrients through your body through this and i believe right there that's a artery or a vein one or the other i think it's probably a vein because it's black the pink is the red blood and i think that is just a webbing of vein network <laughs> that sucks all of the blood back after it gets used up. But this is the is the vein blood. I'm telling you, blue is, is vein, red is artery. And then these are layers of membranes. That's what you're looking at here. Now, how that happened, I don't know. But it's, it's not just this one case. Here's, here's some that are salt spires. But you can see there's some little red way over here. You can just barely see it. The black is the the vein blood. The red is the artery blood. And somehow it converted to salt. Now, I, I don't have a good explanation for this yet. <laughs> well, here's another one. Look at this. But that, I'm telling you, there's no question in my mind that that is absolutely certainly no question whatsoever bodily tissue that has eroded after it had turned to salt. And that, once it's in salt, salt is um, a very ionic solution. It dissolves fairly easily in, in fluids. That's why you see all these spires. Now, this is, same thing here, this is the membranes, and there's blood supplies running through here that I don't know whether it's connective tissue or whether there's blood in them, but there's going to be blood supplies in there. That's just the way blood works. It has to service every single cell in your body every couple of minutes. Here's another one. Look at this. 
Now that, I'm pretty sure, is almost like a bone. Well, I'm pretty sure it is. It's a bone coming up with the abrupt transition that's going to fuse into muscle and tendon, and that all eroded away down to this, this bottom collar almost where it comes out, and that's the abrupt transition where it starts to change into connective tissue. What we have here, I showed you that one, that one. Look at this. Those patterns there are, I believe, some kind of skin patterns. Now, well, they could be anything. They could just be crystalline patterns. Yes, absolutely. But body tissue has that, that shape. Now, why all of this salt is here and where it came from, I do not know. But you are the salt of the earth, and no, no more accurate statement has ever been made. All right? And as this was in Matthew 5.13, they say, you know, you got to take the good stuff out of the salt, basically. All right? When it's become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Well, it's got to go back into the earth and absorb back in the transition metals. And these are the transition metals that make the colors. Where are they? See all these things? These are the metals that are in the, um, the salts. Salts have all kinds of different metals. And depending upon where they were, I think I had a chart in here somewhere. Well, that's a that little one. But I got a much better one. Well, uh, is this it? No. But it does tell you right here, the right salt in the right amount is actually very good for your health. Pink Himalayan sea salt containing 84 minerals. 84 trace elements, calcium, magnesium, potassium, copper, iron. So it does more than just make it taste, food taste better, which is the sodium, you know, sodium chloride, NaCl. It's, it also has all these other little attachments to those. It's one of the most alkaline substances on the planet. It reduces acid reflux, respiratory problems, improves absorption of nutrients in food. So, and it does, because it's, it's a very polar molecule. It has an Na, which is on one side of the periodic table, way over here, and a Cl on the other side. This, you don't worry about, that's all noble gases. They're basically incorruptible. These can just break right apart very easy, and then they can attach with a lot of different things. So, that's what it uses in your body. It's a very ionic solution. And ions are what carry things around in your body. And that's, look at that. It's evaporating. Now, where did it come from in the first place? This is what led me on this journey. Because everything is attached to everything else. There is nothing that sits on its own. Look at this. This is, this is a salt cave. I think it's in Poland somewhere. And they actually have retreats now where you can go and sleep in these salt rooms, these salt mines, and, and you, your respiratory problems are helped. And I'm telling you, this thing here, no question whatsoever, 100% for certain, this has made my lungs more, you know, every now and then you get sort of gooed up in your lungs. This will, will straighten that right out. Uh, well, it helps. See what you think. If you want, they're cheap. I don't know. It was less than ten bucks, I think. But it's, it comes with a little salt, and it comes with this. And it's just—I can't remember. But it wasn't much money. For what it does, it was very, very worth the while. Now, don't forget, layers of salt, and then layers of of connective tissue in between. They, they, they're different mineral makeup, so they look different when they bond with the salt colors and all that, the transition metals, which I showed you over here. So now, wh what did that lead me into? Well, I said, to, I said to myself, where did all this salt come from in the first place? You know, we have to have a certain amount of salt in us every day or we die. Literally, I'm telling you, you need a certain amount of salt one way or the other. And it's supposed to be basically in the middle. And people that don't have that balanced salt, they have issues. And they can be very serious. Where did it come from in the beginning? So, this leads me back to, I start looking through a course I'm taking right now at the it's University of Tokyo, but they're also, it's a, well, here it is, it's a, 
Here it is right here. Corsair, I'm taking it through. Big Bang to Dark Energy. And this is with UC Berkeley, University of Tokyo, Lawrence Livermore, or Lawrence Berkeley, whatever it is. And so I, I, I'm taking this course now. And um, I look over here about ions. No, that, that's, hold on. All right, so here it is again. Now, so here I go to, to Berkeley. All right, UC Berkeley. Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. Their take is that all the matter in the universe was constructed and, and well, here it's, I think it's right. It is now known the elements observed in the universe were created in either of two ways. Okay, the so light elements were produced in the first few minutes of the Big Bang. I, this is unbelievable they can come up with this stuff. It says the other elements, heavier helium, are thought to have origin in the interior of stars, which form much later in the history of the universe. But in the theory, in the, in the interior of stars, that's where they came from. They're already made. They don't change. You get a certain, you get the copper's already done, gold's already done, all that stuff is is formed in these these conditions and then they're released into the universe as these molecules and they never change that's basically what they think i say no they are being constructed and destructed all the time and i point to ions about this but anyway back to this course here you know i went through this and then i posted about you know how can the universe be expanding because this was about expanding space and they're saying somebody posted Linda she's a learner as I was or I am <clears throat> and I say are there any effects of expanding space you can directly notice by humans and I put down no there, there's light is just slowing down there's no vacuum in space and one of the staff people wrote oh you can tell that it, the universe is expanding because of these calculations you know what I'm saying that's not real so I post again I said no empty space isn't empty even Fermi lab says it right here I'm not gonna jump around and just tell you things that aren't true almost 10 years ago empty space isn't empty it's filled with subatomic particles winking in and out of existence because that's when they get hit, they wink. If they're just sitting there not doing anything, moving through the universe, they're fine. But when they get slapped by another molecule, blip, they wink. That's because it's saturated with particles. All right? So I posted it again. I said, no, am I right or am I wrong? If the statement is true that the universe is saturated with particles, Light will slow down. Is that correct? Yes or no? And then I point them to the article. This article, well, that article I just showed you. And, of course, there was no answer. So this is the kind of thing that happens in academia. They'll tell you what they want to tell you, and you accept it, or they fail you. <laughs> now, I don't pay for any of this. I go through Coursera, so I'm there to sort of present my basically opposition to what they're teaching now because they're just all they are is saying if you say the same thing that everybody else says that's what's called peer review everybody says the same thing and then then nobody can can laugh at you like they laugh at me for showing things that are undeniable and asking questions that are are very invasive to their dominance that's the problem all right, so this is what we're up against. Nobody knows where that salt came from. I say it's changed in the body because the enzymes which bacteria create can break apart molecules and reconstruct them into other molecules. So this could be, let's say, silicon. And if some enzyme came up, and ate into that and said, give me a couple of these particles. I'm going to turn you into aluminum. I can make aluminum out of silicon. But I can make carbon out of silicon. All right, I can make carbon into silicon. You can make all these into anything. 
dependent upon what kind of an enzyme attacks it. But enzymes are the most elegant thing on the face of the planet, and they are made of molecules just exactly like that, which literally are little magnetic particles. That's what amino acids are. They're a little tiny, certain polarity with certain dipole moments in that little acid, that little amino acid, and they come out in strings like this. And then when they go, one of them will turn into sodium, one of them will turn into lithium, or one of them beryllium, magnesium, calcium, potassium, whatever it is. And so they're not fixed particles that never change. You can change these particles by adding enzymes and changing their, their elemental makeup. And you could tell that just by looking into ions. Now this is talking about, look, I'm looking at the salt. Of course, this, this whole thing is about salt. And, and it, like I say, everything takes you down a road. How did we get the salt? Where did the salt come from? I put, where did salt chemical come from in the first place? All major rock salt deposits originated from an evaporation of seawater at some time during the geological past. And that is exactly what Yale has admitted to now, that there was a giant flood in the past. Where is it? Somewhere around here. Here it is right here. And that's what preserved my mud fossils. This is Derek Briggs from Yale, who I engaged with for many years. And I showed him my research for many years. And now they finally admit, yes, what I was telling them was correct. They present evidence that exceptional style preservation was due to rapid, which means a flood, early stage precipitation, which means water, with silica cements, which means the silicon and the, all the transition metals and all that, which is salt and sodium and potassium and all that, it facilitated high silica saturation of oceans prior to the appearance of prolific silica, blah, 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 blah. Whatever this was, it was a big worldwide, one layer, worldwide, very fast, heavy waters, high silicates, exceptional preservation of soft potted creatures promoted by silica rich oceans. Exceptional preservation. Exactly what I have. All my mud fossils are from this event. And they are all on the surface of the earth. So this had not happened that long ago. So now we're into a lot of different situations. We're talking about chemistry. We're talking about history, we're talking about biology, we're talking about salt. And how did that transition? What, what transitioned these body parts into, literally into salt? They are just almost 100% salt. There's the, the trace elements are in there, which are in these layers of, um, of tissue, but that's it. All right, now, check this out. This is that salt mine in Poland. They offered salt baths by using natural brine from the mine, stating they staying underground can be even more effective in asthma treatment than inhalations. Now, they observed during World War II, the people who were hiding in the salt mines had respiratory health benefits. And then they actually found out they had all kinds of other benefits being in that mind, you know, they, they became more healthy, let's put it that way. And their respiratory issues cleared up and asthma and all kinds of things. All right, you see how deep this stuff gets. If you're going to be want to really learn something, you're going to have to do what I told you about. Get yourself some of these books. They're cheap. This is a little book like this. I'm doing this when I'm starting this, this book on salt. Now, I may get to a certain point here... And then I go into another section. I just put a little piece of tape on there saying what it is. You know, but if you're going to do this as, as to present to a, a future employer, do this correctly. Do this very nicely and neatly. and clear. So what that requires is two sets. Your first set of books 
is just your notes and so forth and all the different things that you you, you want to transfer into a final all right because otherwise you just get a mess <laughs> trust me I'm not trying to impress anybody, so I don't care about the mess. But if you want to impress somebody, you want to come in and go through this. Here's the questions I'm asking. Where, what is your origin, origin of salts? Sodium chloride, potassium chloride. Where, the kidneys process salts. And you know, the crazy thing is, sodium chloride and potassium chloride have exactly the opposite effects on blood pressure and so forth. Anyway, that's, that's a whole other issue to go into. The kidneys process salt, basically. So when you're dead, it stopped processing. Well, what does the salt do then? Does it invade tissues or does it just sit there in piles? I don't know. Salt invasion could only happen, in my mind, in water or some form of fluids, bodily fluids, to invade other tissue and become these, these blocks of salt that we see all over the world. And they're all over the world. In certain places, they're very salty. I mean, you can see it's quite obvious. Anyway, um, did they all happen from the Great Flood? Could all of this stuff have happened in this one flood event? I mean, it's all on the surface of the earth. All my stuff is on the surface of the earth, too. And my stuff is, um, and, and literally no question it was from this event that Velikovsky said was recorded everywhere on the face of the planet. Everybody had the same story. We were almost hit by a very hot, fiery comet, which apparently was Venus, which is just about as big as us. And for seven days, it approached us, cooking the planet with the more intense than the sun. And at the last time, it just glanced off our atmosphere and really destroyed everything, created this hot salt water flood that Yale agrees with now and preserved all these soft body tissues because of the heat, cooked them, and boiled off the fleshy stuff, turned it into mud. And somehow it boiled off all of the salts, or well, not all of them, but anyway, the what is the origin of salt. Salt is NaCl, let's take. You don't have sodium and you don't have chloride and that's it, they were made in the Big Bang. That's not true. They can be created by enzyme reactions, which are catalysts, which are extremely elegant molecules, which is a whole other issue in chemistry. So now we're going from salt to history to chemistry to physics to astronomy to you know, the origin of the universe, the, you know, giants and monsters. Oh, my God. It's just too much. All right, check this out. This is a chamber in a salt mine in Walekska, Poland. They, I believe they carved these right out of the walls. This is just all was like solid crystal salt. I believe this is all part of the walls and everything inside here. Now, you know, there's obviously some additions made to this and that, but these chambers are literally made from the salt from these creatures. Like this one here. Look at that, isn't that fabulous? <laughs> it's biology turned to salt. And they are, these mines are absolutely, look at this one. This is the same thing. This is the biology of body tissue. And I believe this right here, I'm pretty sure this is little bits of blood. I'm not certain of that. They maybe have painted these spots and they're going to go out and pick them out because this pick is taking out the black blood. I think this is the red blood spot over here. And this is the black vein blood they're taking out because that turns, that's iron basically. You don't want that in your salt. Well, if you ground it up, it'd be okay. But these are the layers of tissue that are the creature's body. Now, is the whole earth one big creature? And then all of the mud fossils that I found are laying on top of this creature and this stuff here. Well, why? You know, there's a lot to think about here. How, how come this is way up the top of the earth? 
Did all this happen at one time? All of these gigantic, gigantic creatures, they appear to be on the surface of the earth, basically on the top of the earth. Everything I found of my stuff, which is DNA tested, CAT scan, and all that, and giants, and they were right on the surface of the earth. Which Velikovsky said, oh, there was a terrible, terrible cat catastrophe here 3,500 years ago. Could it have done all of this? I find that hard to believe. And, but I do see the earth literally now as basically, it's nothing but bodies and corpses on the surface. Let's go with that first. Now, what's under those bodies and corpses on the, sur on the surface? Was the whole earth one gigantic creature? Is it just one, is it everything biology? Everything I have found is. And I found the heart of America, and I can almost literally prove that. And it's called Ship Rock. And I will show that in the next video. All right, so this is salt. The next video we're going to be looking into is the heart of America. All right, stick with me. I tell you, this thing works. All right, I love you all.